a long overdue update with Phil and Brandon, the founders of Mad Capital. We talk about Perennial Fund 1, which by now has put over 10 million skin in the game transition finance to work. We capture their lessons learned, for instance, why revenue-based finance didn't work and how Perennial Fund 2 will look like. Plus how they're planning to push hundreds of millions into regen organic farming through Mad Capital and help to speed up the markets for these crops through Mad Markets. So much to cover and so little time. Enjoy. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Today we have a check-in one with Brandon and Phil of Mad Agriculture, the Perennial Fund and Mad Capital. That's a lot to unpack there and I'm really looking forward. The last time was April 2021. So we're now at the end of 2022 and probably when you listen to this early 2023. So it's a full year and a half plus actually, a year, nine months. And in the, the history of Mad, a lot has happened and in the history of the world as well. So I'm very happy to have both of them joining us again. Welcome, Brandon. Welcome, Phil. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Happy to be here. Yeah, a lot's happened in the last year and a half. And and of course, welcome back. So let's start with the thing pe- most people know you best for, which is the perennial fund one, which suggests there's a two, and we'll get there. Uh, but the perennial fund w- fund one was was and is actually a radical skin the game approach to put about 10 million, I think, to work with um, farmers in the transition, part of their farm or their full farm or expansion or a lot of. Uh, that was the the idea originally, even revenue based. But I think you let go of most of that. What's the current status of? Uh, I think you say PF one, right? In internally in Mad. Yeah, PF one. So last we spoke, April twenty twenty one, we were just rounding the corner on closing that fund. We closed it in February of twenty twenty one. Uh, started making our first loans in April. At that point, we had probably closed, call it four to six loans total. Um, since then, over the last um, 18 months, roughly. Uh, we've now made 36 loans. Uh, we're working with 24 farmers in 13 states, primarily the upper Midwest. So think of it as kind of the corn and soybean country um, into the high plains where a lot of you know wheat and just broad acre grazing systems are. So uh, the concentration of where most of our farms are kind of around the Minnesota zone into Iowa, uh, Wisconsin, and Illinois. But then we've got a farm in Vermont that we've uh, started working with, one in Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, we have a cluster of growers up in northern Montana and then another farm in Oregon as well. So uh, we're working all across the U.S. Uh, we've deployed uh, that full $10 million out of the fund. It's it's going really well. Collectively, those farms manage uh, 44,020 acres and they're transitioning 6,900 and 20 acres to organic because of that financing. So we've been just really excited and and uh, really grateful for all the, I think, just positive feedback that we've gotten from from farmers, from the market, from investors. Um, and it's it's going really well. And according to plan so far, I mean, so well that, you know, we've now launched Mad Capital and we're thinking about perennial fund too. And, and so what are the biggest lessons learned? Because 10 million sounds like a lot and, and nothing at the same time. And it was all raised from, and we get why, but all raised from um, impact investors and of course quite expensive capital, but still you managed to to get it out of the door and work with farmers, even though in some cases they might have had access to cheaper capital. How, how did you get, like what the 36 loans, did it finance what you were thinking at the beginning it would finance or were there big surprises there what you ended up financing actually with these farmers? Yeah, I, I think the biggest surprise for us 
was uh, switch, we ended up switching the model from revenue-based financing, where during the organic transition, we would take a portion of gross revenues uh, during those transition years, which is 36 months from the last application of a prohibited substance. And then once a farm reaches certified organic, we would continue sharing in that revenue. So we'd be riding the revenue decrease during that organic transition. And then also on the other side, when this higher kind of ROI per, you know, per acre and per bushel that they're selling, we would then share in that upside with farmers. Uh, what we ended up learning was that- that was, Sounds amazing it, on paper, but it did work in practice. Paper. We, we can make cool looking graphs around it. <laughs> and, um, it's, and it's worked well across the world for a lot of kind yeah. of risk forward development projects where you look at like hydro or solar, like build own operate transfer revenue model finance has been a really powerful model. So we thought that we could have brought it over to this sector with relative ease, but I'll pitch it back to you to kind of talk about a little bit of the problems we discovered. Yeah, and intellectually, it made sense on paper, uh, on the economic models, it made sense. In field and talking with farmers, uh, we were receiving a ton of good feedback. Farmers were saying, this this sounds great. We would love for you guys to be in the saddle with us, you know, ride it through the transition and to the other side. Um, and then when it came down to actually collecting farmers' balance sheets and income statements and building the financial model with them and starting to paper the loan, we, we started getting a lot of just hesitancy, a lot of um, just unexpected friction in many ways. People were slow rolling it. They weren't responding as quickly. Um, and Farmers were were unsure as to whether this was the right decision. I, I think what it, we ended up learning from that uh, was that because it was so new and unconventional in many ways in ag finance, farmers felt like we were trying to dupe them or pull one over on them. And we, we weren't by any means. I mean, we were showing all of our cards. It was just so different than what you find from the conventional you know debt system uh, that it was it was just shaking things up a little too bit a uh, bit too much. So we ended up. Uh, alternating the model and moving over to uh, a standard interest rate where we ended up essentially getting at the same type of payment schedule that a farmer would have had with a revenue share. Uh, but instead of calling it a revenue share, we uh, call it a bridge loan and we vary the principal payments during organic transition. So we just lower the amount of principal that they're paying to try to match the cash flow of the farm. And they're paying uh, interest plus, call it anywhere, 30 to 50% of the principal balance of the loan during those transition years. And then once they hit certified organic, uh, they can either continue with that note structure as we outlined, or we could restructure it, refinance the note, and then get them on payment terms that make more sense um, for their farm at that stage, because we'll have much more information once they're certified organic in terms of market price and how much land they're managing and how well they've been able to kind of operationalize the initial plan. Um, so that was that was a big learning for us. I think just the difference between what what people say and do, uh, whether that's investors or farmers, um, it's really important to put an MVP out in the world and actually test real world action, real world results um, and we, we went through it uh, with a $10 million fund and 42 investors. And it was a lot of uh, you know communication and making sure we had everybody on the same page as we were just pivoting in real time because you know we needed to deploy that capital and there were a lot of farmers asking for it. And there was just a lot of sensing and learning in order to stitch that market together and to put it to work. And you know now it's gone very well over the last 18 months. At the time, it was, it, it felt like everything was transforming uh, fairly rapidly. Um, looking back, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually felt like a, uh, a pretty timely deployment of the funds. And I think we acted accordingly. So that was that was one of the big lessons. Yeah. Do, was, do you have anything? That you I would say in the though? same vein, um, just like lessons in product market fit, where um, I feel like when in, in an innovative company, you're, you're constantly in this tension between offering what the world wants and what you want the world, what you think the world should want. And um, there's that tension. And so we thought the world should want a revenue based financing vehicle because of all of these sort of skin in the game ethics that um, were driving that, that sort of model. Um, and in the end, you know, I remember sitting under a gigantic oak tree with an old farmer who was 85 years old. Um, and he just looked at Brandon and I with like such a surly look. He's like, He's like, you know, just just basically it came down to like the guts of like a return cap. You know, if we're having like a percent revenue share, 
He's like, well, what if I do really well over the next two years and I owe you 20% of my revenues? He's like, my effective interest rate is going to be like 40%. And, and you know, Brandon and I are both looking there without a great answer. Um, and I, I, I remember that moment pretty clearly. Um, and it stuck with both of us. And so, the, you know, the, the, the art of kind of finding product market fit where you're sort of offering something that the world's willing to uptake and speaking that language while also calling something, you know, above and beyond, you know, working at the margins of change where things need to happen is just such a delicate and artful process. And, and I would say that we learned a lot about that, that evolution and that tension um, in the early work of the perennial fund. Um, I would also say what we learned in the perennial fund is that, you know, the entire perennial fund thesis was built around the idea that, you know, transition finance was a huge gap. You know, traditional bankers would laugh farmers out of their office um, because, you know, they would say, hey, I'm going to lose money for a few years. But if you can stay with me, um, you know, it's going to be good. Um, bankers don't get that. They don't underwrite on future cash flows. Um, and so, um you know, we learned, though, that that transition finance, while an awesome kind of entry point in the market, is definitely not enough. And this is kind of one of the big inspirations for Mad Capitals, that when you lift the hood on a farm and you look at the sort of blend of the portfolio of loans they have, you know, it's everything from traditional mortgages to term notes, equipment loans, you know, outside the farm gate, value add infrastructure. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And so um, I would say the other big learning is, is that transition finance isn't enough. Um, it's definitely an awesome entry point. It's something that's definitely kind of uh, higher risk, mission driven, pre-commercial. Not many people are doing it. Uh, like we're still some of the only people I know in the world that are actually doing transition finance. But what it's let us do is it's as we've gotten to know farms and really understood the financial position of farms and the financial health of farms, it's let us expand our kind of vision and scope of work into a kind of a suite of other financing options that we're developing for, for our farmers. So I would say that's another big learning. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, it's not transition finance alone that's going to get us there. It's transition finance in partnership with traditional finance. And that's a lot of what has informed our thinking over the last you know year to now launching Mad Capital and starting to build um, a two-part capital stack of blending both traditional financing and transition financing because they can work together in their different parts of, you know, kind of the risk curve in terms of different structure, different uh, appetite for collateral, for debt service, how much of it is uh, historical looking and looking at a five-year, you know, balance sheet trend versus forward looking in terms of what we think we can project on cash flow in the future. Um, and there's kind of an artful balance that we're now starting to walk within um, by managing perennial fund one, starting perennial fund two, but then also starting to work with uh, banking and non-bank partners who want to flow financing into this space. They want to finance regenerative ag, they want to finance organic ag, but they don't know how. Um, and that's where we can step in and, and help move um, kind of these big coffers or pools of capital into farmers' hands. <clears throat> and so... Perennial Fund One now is closed. It's out of the door. It will. It is paying back, and will continue to pay back for as long as the loans are running. And then PF two, like what? What? Um, what is the next step in that? Like let's say lineage. Are you going just to to add a zero, ten x, and, and let's get a uh, hundred million into the space? Is that what is missing? Like we need a lot bigger, or actually it is isn't a model that's working, and we just need to tweak it, and we do another ten million. And like what? What is the current thinking? I, I know you're not completely done, um, and and fundraising. I think you're doing some soft fundraising around, um, or some conversations, let's say, uh, around PF two. But what's the current thinking? What that role will be? And then we get to Matt uh, Capital, obviously, which um, is sort of the umbrella over over these different structures and much more. It's a good question. <laughs> so I I want to caveat before I, I overspeak that um, we're we're very much still in development phase, and you know, learning from learning from farmers, learning from investors, and trying to find that right fit as to how far we can push this in terms of uh, a new innovative model that's solving real problems, but then also recognizing the needs of the market, especially as we enter just a more turbulent kind of macroeconomic environment. So we're very much trying to be cognizant of both of those factors because there's an inverse relationship between you know investors wanting the most liquid, highest paying asset in farmers uh, wanting 
uh, to pay the lowest interest rate um, and have absolute surety that they're going to have access to that capital. And those two are the tension that we're living between. Um, what we're thinking about for perennial fund two. So this is all apt to change. Um, we are likely to go to market with a 20 to $25 million fund uh, focused around junior debt. Uh, the reason for that is what we've learned over the last couple of years is that there's a variety of different capital types. You know, there's senior debt, there's junior debt, there's mezzanine debt, there's private equity, there's more risk on equity, there's venture capital, there's this whole spectrum of types of capital. And there's a different, there's a different thinking around how much risk that capital is willing to take and how much it needs to be paid in return for taking that risk. Um, what we were operating in with perennial fund one was with a senior debt facility. You know, we have to take first lien and have real assets as collateral, typically land, uh, crop receivables, crops in the ground, crops in the bin, equipment, other types of fixtures, could be uh, mobile infrastructure, but we're, we're collateralizing and trying to hit a loan to value of you know 60 to 70%. In that first fund, we, we've hit a 59% LTV across all of those assets that we've been able to create. Uh, but what we've been learning is that farmers who are transitioning to organic or transitioning to regenerative organic, they may not always have a very large pool of equity kind of sitting on the side, whether that's a large land base that they own that they're ready to leverage up. They might not have the uh, precedent for producing, you know, positive cash flows for the past decade. They might only have three or four years of experience. So now that we've had more exposure and we're learning more about what capital markets would want to see, we're, we're thinking that moving a little further out on the risk curve, so moving from senior debt to junior debt, meaning that we would be taking second position uh, behind whoever the senior debt holder is, which in this case will likely be us as well through different facilities we're setting up. Um, we can take a little more risk with the farmer in order to push uh, the loan to value ratio higher than what you would find at a traditional financing institution. So in the Midwest, call it Illinois, most community bankers will get up anywhere to a 60 to a 70% loan to value ratio. So if you've got a million dollar property you wanna buy, uh, they will lend you anywhere from $600,000 to $700,000 um, on a first lien mortgage on that property. But the farmer is left to come up with the other $300,000 to $400,000 in cash, which is an enormous amount of cash to just have lying around. Um, so junior debt can fit within that myriad, that spectrum where you've got cash, which is just pure equity. It's liquid. It's ready to move. You've got senior debt. Uh, which needs to take first lien and take priority over that cash. Junior debt can be a sliver that can fit between those two. Um, and how it can fit between those two is just in this example, you could have a $600,000 senior debt um, loan. You could have a $200,000 junior debt facility come in. And then that farmer only needs to come up with $200,000 in cash because they've now utilized more creative financial structuring to enable them to purchase that property, to start building equity, to start transitioning the farm to a form that's more resilient, more resilient and has higher ROI on the other side. And that's where perennial fund two, our thinking is really around trying to create capital that's between what we see is this enormous gap between senior debt and funds and different financiers who wanna hold all the collateral and assets and equity because there needs to be some sort of a bridge between those two worlds, because there, there is that bridge in many other uh, financial realms, um, whether it's, I mean, clean energy, you know, being a perfect example, you could be building a solar uh, field in, in Illinois, and there is probably going to be anywhere from a four to a six part capital stack that comes together there with senior debt, junior, mez, equity. There's the operating company that might have some sort of a kicker. And we think we need to take a lot of these learnings from other industries and bring them to agriculture and to regenerative ag to help facilitate that transition. So to sum it up, thinking about a 20 to $25 million fund to focused on junior debt, it'll be higher cost because of that, but it will enable the transition of more farmland for farmers who don't have as big of an <clears throat> equity base uh, or the historical cash flow. Um, and we believe that based on what we've been learning from uh, from farmers, from the market, and, and by actually testing this, you know, we've been validating this verbally and 
through different financial models, through some of the farms we're already working with in Perennial Fund One, uh, there's been a lot of receptivity because it'll specifically help with land access um, in particular. And, and you see that there's, contrary to what you believe before, that there are enough local banks or local capital providers that want to take that senior debt and are looking, like that kind of deals are there where you can plug in or you're doing that yourself, as you just mentioned, like there, because you need at least one, potentially two other parties, if you have the equity party as well, to be ready for you to to put in the 200,000 or whatever the amount is to make this deal happen. So these kind of deals are there or are quote unquote easy to initiate or to, to start or what have you seen like this, I want to buy my neighbor and I need a million and okay, how do I actually do that? But I don't have all the experience or all the, the traditional finance is asking to easily put that together. Um, those kind of deals are there are enough of those to fill a 25 million fund basically that's what you're thinking now or that's what your models tell you oh cer certainly yeah. especially since the focus is on real assets uh primarily land but the the other piece would be infrastructure and kind of post farm gate um re real assets like a you know dry bean processing facility or a small scale meat processing facility these are things that can also enable uh, more decentralized food system, but then also could increase margin to the farms that we're likely financing on the front end that are feeding into that facility as well. So mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking mostly real assets because in order to build confidence around uh, the collateral base without discounting it too heavily, uh, we need to know that there's a high degree of certainty in you know, the appraisal value or the, the value of the borrowing base that's underpinning that. Because for us and, and for almost any you know, debt shop, we're going to value real estate at a higher degree than something like a you know field of corn that's currently being grown there's a higher amount of risk whether you know a drought comes in or you know a hailstorm could destroy that or the operator could pass away and who's going to come in and harvest that corn and harvest the collateral to then pay back the loan that we had initially made so um being focused more on on the real asset side so to answer your question about senior debt partner uh, we, at Madcap, we have a two-part capital strategy, starting funds to solve niche problems that farmers are experiencing, and then working with these banking partners, community banks, large uh, kind of multinational type names, and then also non-bank specialty finance companies. So these are kind of middle market lenders who have familiarity with, uh, with, with ag and don't have a way to deploy their capital. Um, so what we're doing and what we've just done is we've just set up two of these relationships um, that will be ready to fund. And why do they struggle to to put part if they have familiarity with ag? I mean, what's the the need for you to be the middleman or to be that that funnel builder, basically? Yeah, we, we found that because we are very focused, we're really niche in who we finance and who we serve, which is regenerative organic farmers or farmers transitioning to, um, we have built kind of this natural flywheel or gravitational force where when a farmer wants to transition more land to organic or they're already organic and want to expand their acres, they'd rather work with a virtual line partner that's responsive, that understands their needs, that understands the phone, understands what you're actually doing on the field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get it. There's also um, there's heterogeneity between the, the community banks and the farmers that they they hope to serve. So, you know, you might have a, 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 a community bank that really understands organic in Pennsylvania. Um, they have at a national charter and they have the ability to to um, lend across the country. However, um, you know, they don't have a line of sight on farmers in Montana that need that money. And the community banks in Montana, for sake of example, might not really like organic farmers. So there's this, there's this sort of mismatch and heterogeneity and spatial um, sort of spatial disjointing between the capital that wants and is able to flow into the kinds of farms that we lend to and where those farms actually are. The other, the other side of it is, is that, you know, a lot of these specialty finance companies that we're working with don't have ag, ag experience. <clears throat> they might have a mission driven sort of orientation to their their finance and their banking, but they don't have an ag lending arm and they would love to have exposure to agriculture. As um, they may as be also already doing renewable energy and it's much easier as you just described, like you have, I don't know how many people to work with and I don't know how many types of money you want to put to work and how many zeros that's, I wouldn't say taken care of, but the sector seems to be able to absorb in ag if you want anything 
sustainable, let alone regen organic, <laughs> there's nowhere to go, basically, unless you buy your own farm and do it, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, I would say those are biggest kind of biggest sources of capital. And that's how we're making we're connecting the dots. And there's a, an enormous amount of energy, you know, it, it, at a high level, we see it as a kind of a two sided marketplace where you have you have farmers that um, need this kind of capital to make the transition and thrive in regenerative organic ag. And then you have financiers that um, would love to fund it. And oftentimes they they don't know how to interact, find each other, speak the, the right language, you know, whether it's understanding probability of default and underwriting or you know, credit analysis or, or whether it's simply just finding them and knowing them. Um, and so a lot of what Mad Capital does is we're kind of an hourglass between that two sided marketplace. Um, and to do that, that hourglass has two central flows. It's the relationships with our credit facilities, you know, which are for more standard and good credits, um, but it can do a lot of volume at low cost, which we can talk about. And then we have, you know, our strategic funds, as Brandon was mentioning, which are really for those like higher risk mission driven pre commercial products. And you know, the more that we use like perennial fund one, we use perennial fund two, you know, to sort of proof out the economic viability of things like transition finance, those things will become more readily financeable in, in the marketplace. Right now, traditional credit doesn't know how to deal with that. Um, but I guarantee you 10 years from now, once we finance, you know, 40 to 50 more farmers, well, we'll be funny. Funny, a lot more than that. Maybe add a couple zeros. Yeah, add a couple zeros. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking Hopefully. specifically around transition <laughs> finance. Yeah, sorry, um, but um, you know, people are paying attention already, and um, and it's not going to take long, I think, for that to to find purchase in the marketplace. Yeah, and, and then what's your business model as as Madcap? Are you becoming then I don't know a consultant for these larger capital houses, for a better word? Or is there, because these are large amounts of money, but of course, lower capital costs, hopefully for the farmers, because that's what you, one of the lessons of perennial fund one, it's quite expensive and very good for transition and for, for the riskier things, but not necessarily for everything. So is there enough space for you? Like where, where do you fit in as, as Matt Capital, which is definitely a company, which full disclosure, we're a very, very, very small investor in. Yes. And thank you for that. Very excited to have you. Uh, the, the business model. So I, I just want to make sure we hit on, but I'll circle back to your other question about the senior debt partners and um, the different community debt partners as to how they could enable junior debt. But our business model is essentially like most financial institutions. We collect an origination fee at the front end and we collect a servicing spread. So by, by creating pipeline and by creating a place for these, these capital actors on the other side of our business, to have a spot to place um, low risk capital into regenerative organic farmers to meet their ESG mandates, um, to be able to have a spot to, to move into that asset class, we are able to uh, collect a portion of uh, that, that value that we're generating um, via servicing spread and then an origination fee. So these are low, you know, single digit businesses. Um, this type of business isn't, um, you know, an Amazon type margin business or some sort of a B2B SaaS company. I mean, we have to move millions and a millions lot of capital of yeah. through the funnel in order to capitalize our business and build, you know, a resilient team that's able to positively cash flow. So um, for us, we, we just went through a, a fundraising round. We just raised $4 million um, and closed that up a couple of weeks ago from folks like Trailhead Capital who led the round, Homecoming, Bonaventure, Lace Bark. Um, your, your syndicate was a part of that, uh, which is great. And you know we're using that capital as the runway in order to kind of build our pipeline and build our loan financing machine of mad capital in order to hit the type of loan volume on a monthly and yearly basis to then be able to- and Just to get an idea, like, do you need that, like, is that, 50 million a year, hundreds, billions, like what kind of zeros in, in a world you need to, to have a, a comfortable, let's say machine or a comfortable flow. What, what is like, what are we talking about in terms of volume? If you say we need large volumes to, to make this work. Yeah, we, we could make it work on a fairly lean budget at around 50 million a year. If we were um, doing 50 million a year in loan volume, um, our goals are, are much bigger than that. We're more ambitious than, you know, trying to finance 50 million a year, because if you look at, you know, farmland in Iowa or Illinois, that's selling for 15,000 or $20,000 an acre, that money doesn't go as, as far from an impact perspective as we'd like to see. 
Um, so we, you know, have ambitions of uh, trying to originate roughly 75 to 80 million in new money next year. And then beyond that, double year over year um, for the next, uh, call it three years. Um, at that point, you know, growth may start tapering down unless we find additional kind of distribution channels, channel partners, and moving into other geographies. But, you know, back to the initial conversation around product market fit, we, we have a lot to learn and we're just, we're getting out there. Um, so we're, we're really confident with the pipeline that we have that we're going to be able to hit positive cash flow, um, targeting to do that into next year. Um, and it, it could take into early 2024 because, you know, interest rates are rising. Uh, people are tightening up as we, I think, just recalibrate to the type of environment that we're in right now. Um, but I just wanted to circle back to your your point about the junior senior debt. We are going to be the senior debt holder mm-hmm. for the junior debt um, slug coming out of perennial fund two. And that's largely a product of just risk management um, in order to properly make sure that those assets that are being held by the senior debt partner being being us are being managed properly. And we have some form of recourse. Um, if a farmer does not pay or we're not able to restructure um, the junior debt facility in order for that uh, farm to cash flow, we need the flexibility and have the essentially the stick in order to get creative with how, how we could restructure the note to have the farmer on a payment schedule that they could adhere to, um, or to use that collateral as a, you know, a second form of repayment if necessary. That's obviously the last the the last option and we never want to go there or have to pursue that. Uh, But we do have to think in that way because, you know, debt debt is all about mitigating downside, not maximizing upside where junior debt is, is kind of in that middle zone where we need to mitigate downside, but we can also realize a reasonable um, Mm -hmm. upside. And then as we go further out on the spectrum, as we maybe have our own pools of equity in the future, um, that will be about maximizing upside um, and you still need to manage downside, but um, it's less of, of a co- concern or focal zone because the returns are, are so much higher. Um, so it's, we, we're starting to calibrate as an organization our different means of managing risk as we move further out um, on that curve and into different pools or kind of segments of capital. And you alluded a few times to we're living in interesting times, let's say. What, what does that mean for, for you in general, perennial fund one and two, like interest rates are rising, input costs are going through the roof. We're definitely still in a war. And like it's, it's very different than April 2021 when, you, when we talked last time or, or even a year ago. Or like what does it mean for, for Matt? Apart from that, of course, the mission is stronger or as strong as ever uh, but what does it mean practically um if you're financing these farms like well, what what opportunities are there of certain things and and definitely what challenges are there as well yeah uh, just to hit it on the head higher interest higher interest rates are going to put pressure on the market for people to borrow less you know our business is selling money and if we're selling more expensive money it's going to be harder to sell that money uh, so we're very aware of that and finding different ways to to mitigate and kind of skirt around that by also offering solutions to problems that other banking partners are not offering. You know, by coming out with perennial fund one, by going to market with perennial fund two, we're thinking through different ways of how we can move off of uh, kind of that more traditional senior debt and then incorporate more niche solutions. So that's an attractor that we find for many farmers because we're offering more flexible structures um, that they can't get at their community bank. So I I think that these higher interest rate markets are going to put some pressure on the market as we recalibrate and reset towards w- what is the new normal. Um, unfortunately, I think the new normal is going to be rates um, around what we're seeing today. The Fed is likely to hike again in December uh, before maybe start tapering and call it mid 2023. It's you know hard to know where this will ultimately go. But this is the new environment that we're in until inflation uh, really starts um, getting suppressed and mm-hmm. starts hitting lower you know to mid digits. Um, once we're in the four, five, six percent zone and not you know printing eight percent CPIs, we're, we're going to be in a different higher interest rate environment. And the reality is that farmers farmers need capital 
to operate effectively. And especially in an organic system, if you can borrow at seven, eight or nine percent, you can take that cash and you can produce uh, you know, return on your invested capital of maybe 20 to 25 percent, it's still a good economic good decision deal. in order to do that. Um, so we're seeing that organic itself is slightly insulated compared to conventional systems, which operate on super tight margins. You know, you're talking one, two, three percent. It's just hyper commodified, protected by insurance. They don't have many, many uh, decision points in order to increase you know, their margin and profitability. Um, so that does you know make us a little nervous but then we always go back to that that's the really high macro but then just going back to the fact that we only have to be working with call it 75 to 100 new farmers next year in order to hit our numbers and we know we're in our in conversations with at least that many farmers and that's before even kind of turning on the you know sales and marketing engine which we're pretty excited to do into into 2023 we have some great partnerships that are that are coming so I think it'll put pressure on the market at the top level, uh, but with us at the size that we are today, we are still going to be able to find uh, good good farmers and good deals in spots to place this capital in a, a you know, I think a, a really high quality sense. Um, we're going to be able to find the debt service and the LTVs that we need in order to, to put it to work. I would also add too that like you know seven eight percent interest seems crazy, but historically it's not at all. Like coming out of a three percent interest rate environment, which we just came, was like historically extremely low. And so I think that you know we we tune ourselves so quickly to cost of capital, and anytime it creeps up, we we scream and flail. And and that's not to say that we don't have tons of indicators saying we're going to a recession. There's going to be other problems. At the same time, like our farmers can bear. Um, seven, eight, nine percent. They can they their their yield on organic production, regenerative organic production can outperform that. And so even though that cost of capital is higher than what we'd like, it's it's also not it doesn't have to be that burdensome in, in the way that most people might expect it to be. Yeah. And, and just on the market side, do you see that? Like hitting like the premiums are still there and, and potentially lower inputs obviously helps or lower inputs or being much more resilient. Do you see the business case getting better or at least holding up for farmers out of the transition or beyond the transition? We, yeah, we found that the business case has held up. You know, organic premiums above conventional are, are still roughly 2x. Um, they've they've maintained themselves over the last you know decade with, you know, I, I think just periods of kind of contraction and expansion. But there there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, um, whether it's, you know, geopolitical issues with Russia, Ukraine, or, you know, interest rates and just kind of macro issues. And um, I think because of that, people are also starting to look domestically um, towards creating more food sovereignty for the United States and more uh, just a higher degree of, you know, defense around like, can we grow food here and can can we get by if we need to? Um, and with import markets, uh, just I, I think being in the potential scope of, of being disrupted. Um, we've seen that demand here in the US for US grown organic crops continues to, to grow um, and those premiums continue to maintain themselves. I, we believe that that'll continue um, for the next decade um, unless suddenly, you know, mad capital is so successful that we start transitioning millions of acres uh, faster than we thought and we start suppressing, you know, the price through increasing supply of those products. Uh, but that's it's pretty it's a long way off. It's, it's the best scenario. <laughs> it's the best scenario that's you know pretty unlikely. But I, I mean, I would love to see organics on price parity with with conventional food. I would love for people to be able to walk into the grocery store and to be able to make a decision to buy you know chemical free food and not have it um, cost you know 30, 40, 50 percent more than the conventional counterpart. Uh, but we're still in that world, and for farmers, it's great. For general society, it puts pressure. Um, on just most people um, who can't afford that food. You know, the bottom 50% of Americans are generally not buying organic because it is expensive. It's more expensive than what you can find at instead of buying, you know, conventional Cheerios or Frosted Flakes or something like that. And, and in the general world of mad ag, what, what is happening there, Phil, on the market side? I mean, it's, let's say the umbrella of mad is, is wider than mad capital PF1, PF2. And what, yep. what has happened over the last year and nine months or 10 months or so? 
Yeah, I mean, tons of stuff. I mean, the the uh, the successful fledge of Mad Capital out of the nonprofit. The nonprofit is where we incubated the Perennial Fund One, and now everything we were just talking about is really in Mad Capital PBC, um, Public Benefit Corp. And so, you know, we're tied together by kind of mission, vision, um, a charter of virtues, and basically we share the same brand. But beyond that, now Mad Capital has really the independence and freedom. It has a separate board. It has a separate um, governance. Um, it has the independence to find product market fit and capitalize in the way it needs to capitalize. And so that transition has been a really big shift, a really exciting one for us um, that, you know, the Ag board has been behind. Um, it took us a while to pencil out. It's pretty unconventional to sort of hybrid, not not hybridize. It's the wrong word. I would say it's, it's unconventional to play in the in the landscape of four nonprofits while um, remaining um, toward the same kind of North Star. And so that that um, that process has only been done by a few other people that I know about. Um, and so that that's been really good. Um, we're through that, which feels nice. Um, in the other realms of Mad Ag, um, our Mad Markets team um, is following very much the same trajectory as Mad Capital. Um, we have been working really hard in Mad Markets to connect our farmers to values aligned buyers. Um, those include, in many ways, CPG brands to get started. CPG brands often, you know, um, sort of drive with the most overt mission. Um, my vision for the future of food is not necessarily a bunch of packaged goods on, on Whole Foods shelves, um, but it is a nice starting point. Um, it's where you find a lot of mission alignment. And so um, we've been working with a lot of CPG companies, I think over 25, um, really helping them um, discover design and implement their regenerative sourcing and climate action goals. And the way that we've been doing that is helping them kind of plug into um, our network of farmers through their procurement and supply. And so um, that's all going really, really well. Um, you know, there's uh, basically we've evolved Mad Markets into kind of three core value offerings. One is that kind of consulting um, arm where we help um, lift the hood on brands and and help them figure out that strategy. Um, for regenerative supply. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we help farmers um, uh, basically broker their crops into those um, markets. So we, we basically can take a whole portfolio of crops and match make them um, with folks. Um, I, I, gotta, I can't tell you all the names, but basically a lot of really awesome, badass brands. Um, and then in the middle of that, um, we are now starting to move and look more closely to actually acquiring assets, infrastructure, um, what we found is, is that most of the hard work happens um, where you aggregate, process, clean, bag, tag, and deliver um, wholesale ingredients. Um, without really moving into that space, we are really limited to do some of the more creative things that the regenerative revolution needs. Things like, you know, tying impact to crops or reimagining how we contract or rebalancing, you know, the power in, in sort of price negotiations between, you know, what the buyer and the, and the farmer gets. There, there's all of this innovation that happens basically in the middle of the country where infrastructure exists. And so um, we're taking a really close look at actually moving into owner operator of strategic assets across the country. Um, and uh, we're well on our way of making the first acquisition probably, you know, come Q1 of next year, which I can't say anything about yet, but we're super excited about. It's going to be exciting. But so that, does it, did I miss it? But Matt, market is going to spin out as well. You're going to repeat the process you did with Matt Cab, and it's going to be a for-profit um, under the bigger Matt umbrella. Yep. Very cool. And are you then looking as well or pushing these partners on like recipe changes or or like you cannot just buy one cash crop, you really need to go for rotations, like the big food redesign that the report of, of the Ellen MacArthur, um, that we, we cannot just fo focus on one cash crop and let the rest of the rotation be taken care of by the farmer. Like we need to imagine what is it, the, the, the uh, rotation risotto that uh, Dan Barber always talks about. Is that something that's on literally on the plate? Literally, literally on the plate. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot of kind of multis crop rotational um, selling. This is part of the power of our brokerage program where, you know, when we have the whole crop portfolio on a farm and we're matchmaking that against various buyers, we can then stitch together a variety of crops and kind of think about whole rotations in a new way that, you know, most, most folks can't do. 
Um, the other thing that we're doing a lot of, which I can speak to, is um, our Mad Markets team is the is basically the marketing arm of the Perennial Promise Grower Co-op. Um, those farmers are, I think, 39 farmers in mostly Minnesota, Wisconsin, Dakotas, and they're responsible for something like 80% of the Kernza production in the world. Um, and Kernza is the uh, perennial wheatgrass that was developed originally by Rodale, but really kind of taken to market at the Land Institute. Um, it's one of the first forays into to perennial staple crop production. Um, and we see that as a really powerful force um, in agriculture um, to re-perennialize staple crop production. And so we are currently brokering um, an enormous amount of Kernza to all of the usual suspects, um, you know, to really drive that ingredient in the marketplace. So, you know, when we have the power to say, hey, um, you know, when we have the power of being able to have those market connections and create the offtake, it gives us an enormous amount of ability to go to new farms and say, hey, have you thought about this crop? Have you thought about diversifying? Have you thought about perenniality? And for for myself, when I think about all of the regenerative practices of the world, the two most powerful ones that I um, always go back to are basically diversification of your crops and creating more diversity. And the second is perennializing. Um, those two, above all, have the most power to heal the land and create economic resilience for the farmer, as well as ecological resilience for the farm. And so um, Kernza is one of those kind of hero ingredient, holy grail transformations. And while it still is expensive to buy and there isn't a lot of acres in the world yet, um, I think it is kind of a front runner in what we're going to see in just sort of the diversification of our food system. So. That's what we're shooting for, and that's kind of how we're involved on the market side. And, and without good market access and, and good offtake, as we saw in, in the in the farmers uh, transition finance for farmers series, without that transition finance doesn't make a lot of sense unless you have a market. Obviously, I mean the the business of the farm needs to needs to make sense. Anything else before we we wrap up? Things you want to share? Things you're looking for? Ways people can get involved? Help? Uh, what what do you would you like to share with uh, the podcast audience in this in this check in? Yeah, one thing that's coming to my mind is that we're we've become much more focused over the last twelve months on how we build regenerative agriculture as an asset class. And in order to do that, we need to work on bringing more commercial structures to the industry and not just having all of these kind of one off cutesy deals here and there. We need to make sure that we're building something that with sophisticated structure that the markets can understand and interact with. Um, so we are becoming Is that much difficult because it might be less mad than sometimes, like letting go of the revenue share, revenue go of, I see Phil laughing and Brendan as well. Like, I mean, I just literally had this morning conversation about it. Like how edgy do you want to be? Like, do you want to to plant a new tree or, or work on the branches and grow a new branch into an existing one? And and how, I mean, this is a whole lot of rabbit holes. I was trying to wrap up and it's not going to work. Uh, but how, how difficult is that for, for both of you? I would like both answers. Um, who takes it first is up to you. <laughs> it's challenging. It's challenging because we, we went out the gates with some of the most radical types of financing that were available to farmers. And we were truly probably a little out over our skis with the, the model that we were offering in the market. And we've we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. We, both of us still have a natural inclination to take risk, go for it, innovate, come up with new ideas, like have creative brainstorming sessions and want to truly change the system. But it's just become more apparent um, as we've started working with more and more farmers that we, we need to maybe throttle back that like initial emotional aptitude to just want to really go pedal to the metal and, you know, create a revolution, change the system and, and come in with a tempered approach and realize the balance. And I think that that delicate balance that we need to walk over the next five to 10 years in order to build the kind of momentum that this industry needs and to build the type of I think just sophisticated thinking that this type of this industry needs in order to truly thrive um, and gain the the type of scale that we want to see um, over the next couple of decades. Um, and so, because of that, I think maybe one way we've started internalizing that is both the realities, but also just um, 
But personally, it's interesting to me to have this two-part capital stack where we have permission to innovate, to try new things, to solve problems that are currently not being solved by farmers, but then also being able to tap into you know, the, the Black Rocks and the JP Morgans and these big institutional players who want to move money into this space through our traditional financing arm and that side of the business. So we're able to learn what is happening on the bleeding edge, what are we seeing in field, and how do we create financial structures that are pre-commercial and mission-driven, as Phil was saying, and then how do we balance that with your traditional 30-year fixed mortgage that's kind of the backbone of this industry. So we're we're just dipping our toes into that sandbox in many different ways, um, and I think it's it's what's necessary in order for us to ultimately bring billions and then trillions of dollars to this space to provide the capital backbone that it's going to need. Otherwise, it's just going to be these niche 10 million, 50 million, and $100 million funds, which is not even close to the amount of scale that we need to see in order to unlock uh, massive amounts of capital flows into regenerative organic ag. So we're, we're starting to build the team and build our, actually our theory of change around that. And we're going to start working on a thought piece um, around that type of work so that we can release it publicly and hopefully maybe put out a call to action um, to other folks who have been on a similar journey to us um, over the last few years and ultimately rally support from these large capital markets so that we can help more of our farms transition to regenerative organic ag. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see a direct trade-off between being commercially robust and viable and being radical. I mean, at the end of the day, if the land is being healed and the farmers are experiencing the full vitality of life on that land as stewards, then that's a good thing. Um, and so I think that what we have to bring to that ambition and that vision of transformation is a ton of stuff. And, you know, for us to be able to be above board and be legitimate and attract a Goldman Sachs, I'm totally fine with that. Um, money, I used to be scared of money. Uh, it used to feel like, you know, coming from a fairly leftist um, sort of economic ideology, um, I've, I used to be really scared of sort of the power of money, but I really come to see it as, as just like water. You know, it's got to flow into the right places. And, and if we can do our job to flow it and the people that we are flowing it to are benefiting disproportionately, then why not let it ride and, uh, and, and have a lot of fun? Um, you know, it's, it's, I've learned that there are good people everywhere. When we think about Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, it's not like these people are nefarious, right? Like there's very few nefarious people in the world. And most of the times when you get to know folks across all of these institutions that we label as bad, you end up finding really awesome aligned virtues. The question becomes how, right? It's like, how do we do it? And we get stuck there big time. And I think that mad capital is living in that really kind of, uh, that really dangerous margin, you know, between like being really radical and in, in a traditional sense of like lots of risk taking and creating new things. I mean, creating something utterly new in the world for it to work is a very risky thing. And it's a recipe for total burnout um, to learn how to take what has worked and shape it toward a more virtuous future um, is is something that I think we're all about. Um, and you know, as Brandon said, we have this kind of cocktail of different um, capital strategies, um, which I think we're really excited about um, that range from very traditional to sort of avant garde and on the on the margin. And so I think we're going to try to hold it all, um, to be honest, and uh, while also surviving financially and keeping our employees happy. And I mean, now we have eight people on the team, you know, and those people have spouses and kids and like you know, what we were doing three years ago, um, you know, on very little money and really going for it. I mean, we've got to be thoughtful and that doesn't mean we're not going to do what's right. I mean, that's that I want to be very clear about that. You know, we're we're really, really charging hard with most the utmost integrity at the same time. You know, I think we are probably just a little more cautious in the amount of risk we're taking because, you know, we have now you know, an enormous number of investors that are involved and those investors are our friends. And, you know, we have an enormous number of, of farmers involved and those farmers are our friends and the more risk we take, you know, um, threatens all of that. And, 
you know, the thing that I, I come back to at the end of the day, you know, despite all of these philosophical wonderings and challenges and how do you reshape the economy and the world and blah, 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 right? Like you can get lost in that zone. At the end of the day, the farmers that we work with and work for and serve are universally happier and better off because of the work that we're doing with them. And I would give you the cell phone number of any of them, and I know they would sing our praises. And for me, at the end of the day, you know, we can we can sort of get lost in all of, are we doing enough? Are we going big? Are we taking enough risk? At the end of the day, the land is happier, the farms are happier, and that makes me sleep well. I think it's a perfect ending to this check-in interview. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast, for taking time out of a very busy schedule. Um, fundraising, building, getting money out of the door, monitoring and, and selling uh, a lot of currency uh, is, is not an easy feat. So thank you so much for, for taking that time for the work you do. And of course, coming here to share about the journey. Thanks, Ken. We appreciate it. Yeah, this is fun. Super fun. Great to talk always. Um, appreciate the invite and uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.